It's easy to think about the idea of a singularity and dismiss it. After all, everything that we know of in physics, at a fundamental level, comes in quantized little bits. Particles and antiparticles with a fixed, finite amount of energy inherent to each of them. No matter what tricks you use, there are certain quantum properties that are always conserved and can never be created or destroyed, not in any interaction that's ever been observed, measured, or even computed. Things like electric charge, momentum, angular momentum, and energy are always conserved in all circumstances, as are numerous other properties. And yet, inside of a black hole, the math of general relativity is very clear. All of that matter and energy that goes into forming it, no matter how it's initially configured, is going to wind up collapsed down to either a single zero-dimensional point, if there's no net angular momentum, or stretched out into an infinitely thin one-dimensional ring, if there is spin or angular momentum present. While many hope that quantum gravity will save us from the inevitability of a singularity, many don't think that even that is possible, for very good reasons. Here's why a singularity at the center of every black hole may be completely unavoidable. In principle, as Einstein first realized, if all you have is some configuration of matter that starts off distributed over some volume, with no rotation or initial motions, the outcome is always the same. Gravitational attraction will bring all of that matter together until it collapses down to a single point. Around that point, dependent on how much mass or energy there is altogether, there will form a region of space known as an event horizon, a volume from within which the escape velocity or the speed you'd need to travel to escape from this object's gravitational pull would be greater than the speed of light. That solution to Einstein's equation was first worked out in detail by Carl Schwarzschild and represents the configuration known as a non-rotating, or Schwarzschild, black hole. For many years, astronomers and physicists alike wondered if these objects were just mathematical oddities and perhaps even pathologies predicted by general relativity, or whether these corresponded to real objects that were out there somewhere within this universe. The story began to change in the 1950s and 1960s with the work of Nobel laureate Roger Penrose, whose pioneering work that demonstrated how black holes and their event horizons could form from an initial configuration that didn't have one earlier. His was the work that Penrose, quite deservingly, was awarded the Nobel Prize for, and it kicked off a proverbial firestorm of black hole research. If black holes could realistically form within our universe, then that means we should be able to do two things with them. We should be able to calculate under which physical circumstances they can form, and hence, where we expect to find them and what signatures they ought to give off. And then, we should be able to actually go out and find them, detect their signatures, and even measure fundamental properties about them if our technology ever reaches that point. For the first one, all you really need is enough mass concentrated within a given volume of space. This could occur because you have a collection of matter that's of relatively low density, but that occupies a enough space so that when you look at it as a whole, it must inevitably collapse to a central singularity, a direct collapse black hole. You can also have a black hole arise from the implosion of the core of a massive enough star. In a core collapse supernova, for instance, where the core is massive enough to collapse to a black hole. Or, you could have multiple massive and dense objects, like stellar remnants such as neutron stars, merge together and cross a critical mass threshold, where they'll become a black hole. These are three of the most common ways that the universe could actually create a black hole. Over on the observational side, there are many different signatures that a black hole gives off. If a black hole is a member of a binary system where another star orbits it from afar, then we can see the star move in a helix-like shape as it moves through the galaxy, revealing the black hole's presence from gravity alone. If it's at the center of a galaxy, we can see other stars orbit it directly. If there's a close-in stellar companion to a black hole, 
then the black hole could be capable of stealing or siphoning mass from the companion onto itself. And much of that mass will be heated, accelerated, and shot out in X-ray emitting jets. The first black hole ever detected, Cygnus X1, was found from exactly this X-ray emission. We can also detect what effects black holes have on their surrounding matter. They develop accretion disks with flows within them, flaring when these flows get accelerated and shot out in bi-directional jets. They can tidally disrupt any stars or planets or gas clouds that get too close to them, creating cataclysmic signatures when they do so. They can inspiral and merge together, creating gravitational wave signatures that we can directly detect, and have done so many dozens of times since 2015. And, perhaps most famously, they bend the light from background sources that are behind them, creating an image of the vaunted event horizon of a black hole itself that can be detected in radio wavelengths of light. From everything we've learned from a theoretical and observational perspective, we can not only conclude that black holes should and do exist, but we've measured their properties, confirming a lower mass limit for them of around three solar masses. Additionally, we've measured their event horizons directly and confirmed that they have the properties, sizes, gravitational wave emissions, and light bending features that are extremely consistent with what general relativity predicts. Black holes, for as much as we can say so about anything in the universe, really do exist. But what's going on inside of their event horizons? This is something that no observation can tell us, unfortunately. It's only the things that occur outside of the event horizon, where the escape velocity of signals are below the speed of light, that can ever reach us in our location. Also, outside the event horizon. Once something crosses over to the inside of the event horizon, there are only three properties that can be measured from outside, the mass, electric charge, and total angular momentum of the black hole. That's it. Astrophysicists sometimes refer to these three properties as the type of hair a black hole can have, with all other properties getting eliminated as a consequence of the famous no-hair theorem for black holes. But there's a tremendous amount to be learned by looking at the differences between an almost black hole and an actual black hole. A white dwarf, for example, is a dense collection of atoms, often greater in mass than the Sun, but smaller in volume than the Earth. Inside, at its core, the only reason it doesn't collapse is because of the Pauli exclusion principle, a quantum rule that prevents any two identical fermions, in this case, electrons, from occupying the same quantum state in the same region of space. This creates a pressure an inherently quantum degeneracy pressure that prevents the electrons from getting close beyond a certain point, which holds the star up against gravitational collapse. Similarly, an even denser neutron star is a collection of neutrons, or in an even more extreme scenario, a quark-gluon plasma that may involve quarks beyond the lowest energy up and down species, held together by the Pauli degeneracy pressure between their particle constituents. Many have wondered, however, if there couldn't be something inside an event horizon that was static, stable, and of a finite volume, holding itself up against complete collapse down to a singularity the same way that a white dwarf or neutron star holds itself up against collapsing further. Many contend that there could be some sort of exotic form of matter inside an event horizon that doesn't go to a singularity, and that we simply have no way of knowing whether this occurs or not without being able to access the information inside a black hole. That argument, however, falls apart on physical grounds. We can see this by asking and answering a very specific question that illuminates a key feature that ultimately leads to an inescapable conclusion. The presence of a singularity within a black hole's event horizon. That question is simply as follows. What's the difference, then, between something that doesn't collapse down to a central singularity, forming an event horizon along the way, and something that doesn't? The key is to take on a particle physics perspective here. 
Think about what sort of force the inner more part of the object has to exert on the outer more part. Whether a quantum force like the strong nuclear, weak nuclear, or electromagnetic force, a classical force like general relativity, an inherently quantum effect like Pauli degeneracy pressure, or a novel quantum force like some yet to be discovered quantum theory of gravity, there's a limit to how fast any of these effects can propagate outward the speed of light. These forces all have a maximum speed at which they can travel, and that speed is never greater than the speed of light. And that's where the big problem arises. If you create an event horizon, then from within that region of space, any attempt from an inner more component to exert a force on an outer more component will run into a fundamental problem that if your force-carrying signal is limited by the speed of light, then in the time that passes from when the inner more particle emits the force carrier, the force carrier travels to the outer more particle and the outer more particle absorbs it. We can calculate how that system of the inner more particle, the outer more particle, and the force carrier exchanged between them evolves. However, it is possible that these black holes are actually gateways to a baby universe that resides within them. Although whatever falls in would be reduced to pure energy with no evidence existing in our universe, outside the event horizon, for any exotic behavior that happened to the infalling particle on the other side. From our perspective outside an event horizon, and from the perspective of any particle that crosses over to the inside of an event horizon, there's simply no way to escape it. In a finite and relatively short amount of time, any infalling matter must wind up at a central singularity. Although the physics that we know of does indeed break down and only give nonsensical predictions at the singularity itself, the existence of a singularity truly cannot be avoided unless some wild, exotic, new physics, for which there is no evidence, is invoked. Inside a black hole, a singularity is all but inevitable.